I'd now like to introduce Professor Jean Akopoulos, Professor of Economics. So he was also a graduate of Yale University <clears throat> and directed the Fixed Income Research Department at an investment bank, which became the biggest mortgage powerhouse on Wall Street. His research focused on collateral equilibrium and the leverage cycle and promoting debt forgiveness, leverage constraints as a policy instrument on central banks. One of my good friends worked on the, as a, on the Tobin project and often spoke of his work, and so I'm proud to present Professor Giannakos. Thank you. <laughs> How does this? I'm the only one not to. I'm the only one not to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> so when I was 18 years old and a junior at Yale, mathematics major, I was looking for beauty and I found Herb Scarf. Uh, there's Herb Scarf. <laughs> he taught a graduate mathematical economics course and I found it had the same elegance, the same precision, the same certitude as I had in my, in my mathematics classes, but it was about the real world. So I decided to move gradually from, economics in, from mathematics into economics and I went to Harvard in both fields and I was lucky to study with Kenneth Arrow who was the probably the greatest economist of the 20th century, both economic theorists. And the reason I show you their pictures is Herb Scarf just died last year and Ken Arrow just died a few weeks ago. And this is a picture with me giving the Arrow lecture two months ago uh, he f at Columbia University where he was a graduate student. He flew from California to discuss my talk. 95 years old, you see the same smile he has Herb Scarf had. So that's why I became an economist. And I became a theoretical economist. And for nine years after coming to Yale to teach, I did economic, pure economic theory. I didn't do anything that was the slightest bit practical. So I decided I'd go visit uh, an investment bank called Kidder Peabody. And after spending my sabbatical there, they asked me to run the research department from Yale, to hire them a new research department, and then after I hired it, to run the department from Yale. And I noticed the whole thing on Wall Street was about collateral and people defaulting, and in no course I'd taken in economics was collateral or defaulting or anything even mentioned. And that was what everything was going on on Wall Street. So I wrote, a, I, I invented what I called collateral equilibrium. And then, uh, after five years at Kidder Peabody, the firm went out of business, 135 years, and there I was the last five years and it went out of business. I had to go up from Yale to my office at Kidder Peabody and invite the 75 people in research in and say, you're fired, sorry, you're fired, you're fired. And at the end, I got up and went to the office next door and the guy said, you're fired. So we, <laughs> so we, <laughs> we founded a, after Kidder closed, we founded a hedge fund, a mortgage hedge fund called Ellington Capital. And three years after that, in 1998, there was a margin call which destroyed long-term capital, the famous hedge fund founded by the Nobel Prize winning economist Sharp and Merton, you may have remembered it from then. Anyway, we celebrated their collapse. Two months later, we got a margin call and we almost collapsed and went out of business. So I figured two collapses in five years can't be all my fault. So I thought of something, <laughs> thought it was a systemic thing, so I called it the leverage cycle. And uh, that turned out to be a blueprint for what happened in 2008. But even though we knew the blueprint, we almost went out of business again in 2008. And the new thing I learned was that forgiveness is actually the essence of what happens after a crisis. And the only way we could have gotten out of the horrible crisis 2007, 8 and afterwards that afflicted the US was to have forgiven part of the mortgage debt, partially forgiven it. But we didn't forgive a penny of mortgage debt. I testified twice in Congress about forgiving mortgage debt. I represented the consortium of hedge funds who all wanted to forgive, you know, take the losses themselves, forgive the debt because they'd be better off that way, but we weren't able to forgive any debt. So I gave the graduation speech at the University of Athens in 2010 and I said, you shouldn't feel so bad, you Greeks worried about defaults and stuff like that. There are more people in America who've defaulted on their mortgages and been thrown out of their houses than there are people in all of Greece. And so um, I'm sure your debt will be forgiven. And so <laughs> one of the professors who heard the talk became the finance minister of Greece and last year he hired me to help the Greek debt negotiation with 
the Europeans. So what is leverage? Leverage is um, loan to value means if you have a $100 house and you borrow 80, that's 80% 80 loan to value. The down payment is 20%. The leverage is five because $20 enables you to buy a $100 house. It also represents the risk you run. If the house goes up 1% to 101, you sell it for 101, you pay back the 80, you've got $21 on your initial investment of 20. You made 5% even though the house only went up 1%. If it goes down 1%, you lose 5%. So leverage, leverages your capital, also leverages your risk. So it's a risky thing to leverage. But, what, so everybody knows that. But what was the mathematics of leverage? <laughs> I'm sure you do. What's the mathematics of leverage? That was what interested me. If leverage is so important, the loan to value, how can one supply equals demand equation for loans determine the price, the interest rate, and also the leverage? It seems like one equation can't determine two unknowns. That was what piqued my interest mathematically in the thing to begin with. And then I had to show mathematically that more leverage raises the price of assets. If you can borrow more on a house, the price of houses is going to go up. In fact, it can go up so high, it'll be higher than if you could borrow as much as you want. Because the things people can use as collateral, and there are only two basic things, big things, it's houses and schooling. You can borrow, if you've got a house, you can borrow if you're going to school, and the price of housing and the price of schooling have skyrocketed. So the leverage cycle is you start off with some asset worth 100. You can borrow $80 on it, 80%. People feel safe, the lenders. They don't worry. They let you borrow more and more because they're not worried about the fault. The leverage goes up to 90 95%. That raises the price of housing. Now you can buy a higher percentage of a higher number. There's a huge amount of debt in the economy. When something bad happens, even just a little bit bad, housing prices go down. The big losers are the people who are leveraged so much, just like we saw, five to one, 10 to one. They're the ones who, so the best buyers are the ones who lose the most. So they're out of the market and now the price goes down further and now the lenders are really worried and they won't lend you much on your house anymore and the price falls even further and you're left with a huge debt and low asset value. And that's the leverage cycle. And at that point, there's no getting out of the problem except to forgive some of the debt. So historically, we see that the green line is housing prices from 2000 to 2006, 90% up in six years, and then down. Bob Schiller, probably last year, said it was all irrational exuberance. But if you look at the purple line, that's the loan to value, how much you could borrow on a house. You see that skyrockets and goes down at the same time. You look at the red line, these are prices of subprime AAA bonds, you look at the blue line that's loan to value and you see it dropped in the 98 crisis I told you about, but just briefly, and then it plummets in the 2008 crisis and it's parallel to the price of housing. Here are different countries, how their leverage went from 97 to 2007. On the right you see Ireland, Denmark, you know, Norway, Spain, all huge jumps in leverage. You see Germany and Japan in the middle, their leverage went down. And if you look at what people on the horizontal axis had the most leverage and which ones on the vertical axis had the most housing price increases, they're all the same. In Germany and Japan, no leverage, no increase in housing down at the bottom. People who suffered the most were the people who leveraged the most. So, Leverage needs to be contained. The central bank should contain leverage, but they should also work on forgiving debt. So why do I say forgiving debt is so important? Well, in, in 2008, if you had a $160,000 house, a loan, and the house had fallen in value to 100,000, who's gonna pay back 160,000 on a house that's worth 100,000? If you forgave 160 down to 90, you could get the 90, but not a single penny of subprime debt was forgiven, and what happened, the average recovery of half a trillion dollars of defaults was 23%. You got 40,000 back instead of 90,000. That's why in 2008, I wrote a series of op-eds in the Times saying we have to get, and testified, we have to get debt forgiven. It's the only way, it's better for the lenders as well as for the borrowers. So, the Greek debt is the same thing. Greece has the staggering debt, they're not gonna be able to pay it back. They've been asked to pay 3.5% of GDP for the next decades. Decades and decades, 3.5% of GDP. No country in history has done that. The United States' greatest generation that fought World War II, and then is greatest generation, because they fought World War II and paid down the huge debt afterwards, we only paid back 3.5% of GDP twice in 30 years, not every year for 30 years. So the IMF finally has come around and says Greece can only pay back 
but the Europeans don't want to go down to 1.5%. If they did go down to 1.5%, the debt wouldn't be paid back. So there's a standoff. The main reason the Europeans don't want to write down the debt is not because they think Greece is going to pay it. They're perfectly rational. It's because it's awkward to write it all down. The Central Bank of Greece, if they wrote 300 billion, Central Bank of Europe, if they wrote 300 billion euros down to 100 billion, they'd have to take an immediate $200 billion loss. They'd have to be recapitalized. Merkel would have to go to the German public and suddenly raise more money because she'd forgiven Greek debt. And she doesn't want to do that. And it would be catastrophic politically for her to do. So they're not going to forgive the debt. So what should be done? So my proposal was make the debt payment that Greece should make um, indexed to unemployment. If unemployment's 23%, as it is now, the Greeks shouldn't pay anything back. If it goes down to 15%, maybe they can pay 1.5%. If it goes down to 3% unemployment, like it was in the US after World War II, maybe then they can pay 3.5% indefinitely. If you can't agree on a number, 3.5% versus 1.5%, you can agree on a schedule while I'm going over. OK, so the last slide's coming up. The second thing was, second thing was if they go on the schedule, then they'll owe they won't pay back as much money. So how can you get the Greeks to think their debt's forgiven while the Germans think they haven't forgiven the debt? That's the way to solve the problem. <laughs> so what you do, what I recommended was the Greeks, the Germans, the Europeans say, we'll forgive two euros every time you pay us back one euro. So the Greeks are obviously going to think, oh, they've forgiven two-thirds of our debt. We only have to pay a third of it back. They'll immediately act as if they've only got a third of the debt. The Germans won't have to pay back, forgive, for a long time. Greece hasn't paid back a single euro yet. It'll take them a long time to pay anything back. So the forgiveness can be very gradual. So the last slide is, this is all not original. The Merchant of Venice was exactly a story of the leverage cycle. It's not a story of... It's a story of the leverage cycle. It's a story of uh, a margin call and Shylock uh, you know, demanding his. So it's an argument about what the rate of interest should be. And the final, you know, but no one can remember the rate of interest that Shylock charges Antonio and the Merchant of Venice. All they can remember is the collateral. It's a pound of flesh. And that's why Shakespeare understood collateral is more important than interest. He made one memorable and the other not memorable. And when they have the, the trial, after the margin call, it turns out that uh, the judge um, asks for forgiveness and makes a famous speech about the quality of forgiveness and suggests forgiving the debt. And uh, the play ends with Bassanio trying to praise the judge, who changes not the terms of the debt, but the collateral, a pound of flesh, but not a drop of blood. He says, what a great decision. And so she, um, she said, can I reward you? She says, well, how about giving you that ring? He doesn't realize it's his love disguised as the judge. He says, I can't give it to you. I, I got it from my wife. And uh, I can't possibly give it to you. And she said, if you want to reward me, you have to give me the ring. So he gives her the ring and she ends up forgiving him. If there's something you have to do or you can't do, you have to be forgiven. So Shakespeare said it all, but he didn't use any mathematics. 